Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to the press conference today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started right away uh, as we're on a bit of a tight schedule. Uh, so without further ado, I'm just going to introduce CFEB Director Richard Cordray. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. And thank you to Attorney General King, Attorney General Madigan, Attorney General Miller, and Attorney General Conway uh, for being with us. Financial products can be a way for Americans to achieve dreams, to buy a home, to start a small business, and importantly, to go to school. People from all walks of life go to college to climb the ladder of economic success. And it's important that the markets work properly to allow them the opportunity to realize their dreams. But as we all know from the financial crisis, normal market forces do not always work. In those heady years, we saw how some lenders made money by setting up borrowers to fail with mortgages they could not afford. Recently, we're finding some of those same mismatched incentives when it comes to the for-profit college market, which saw huge gains in the lead-up to the financial crisis, with enrollment more than tripling between 1998 and 2008. What kinds of people are these for-profit colleges recruiting? They seek aspiring leaders who are eager to be one of the first in their families with a college degree. They recruit single mothers in the midst of their careers looking to better their lives. And they recruit the newly unemployed who are looking to rejuvenate their employment prospects in a tough job market. These consumers are exactly the types of people who might gain the most from quality programs in higher education. But the corporations that own these colleges often seem to care more about dollar signs than diplomas. At the Bureau, we believe that many for-profit colleges may be saying one thing to students as they load them up with debt, but saying another thing entirely to investors as they sell their business model. In the end, the outcomes for many of these students do not live up to the promises the schools made to them. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, for bachelor degree students starting a four-year program in 2004, just 28 percent of students attending for-profit institutions graduated within six years. This was half the rate for students at four-year public institutions. This is truly an American tragedy. Students may think they're climbing a ladder to success when instead they're getting knocked down, crushed by student debt that does not help them gain a better job or a better life. Because of these distorted incentives, we believe there may be significant consumer protection risks. So we're looking at a wide range of the risks facing students who are often pressured to use up valuable government benefits and then take out substantial federal and private loans. We've even heard troubling stories in this sector about high pressure tactics that are employed to coax veterans to hand over their GI Bill benefits. Today we're taking our first public enforcement action against a for-profit college. We filed a lawsuit against ITT Educational Services, one of the largest and most expensive for-profit chains in the country. Its schools are known by various names, such as ITT Tech and Daniel Webster College, and they've enrolled tens of thousands of students online at about 150 institutions in nearly 40 states. We believe this company misled students by overstating their job prospects and likely salaries upon graduation. Then it pushed them into high-cost private loans that were likely to end in default. Most of ITT students borrow large sums of money from the federal government to pay its high tuition costs. For many, though, federal loans do not cover the full costs. Students face a tuition gap that requires them to find other sources of funding. To fill this gap, ITT set up its own private student loan program. But these private loans were not available to students until their second year at ITT. To encourage new students to enroll and to bridge that tuition gap, ITT provided students with a zero interest loan, typically payable in full at the end of their first academic year through a program that it called temporary credit. We believe ITT knew from the outset that many students would not be able to repay their temporary credit balances or fund the next year's tuition gap. ITT knew students would have to take out one of the high-cost private student loans that it set up for just this purpose. But ITT kept students in the dark about its lending model that it freely shared with investors. In fact, we found that ITT used its financial aid staff to rush students through an automated application process without affording them a fair opportunity to understand the loan obligations involved. In some cases, students did not even know they had a private student loan until they started receiving debt collection calls. For some borrowers, these loans came with interest rates of more than 16 percent over 10 years, which is like financing your college education on your credit card. These expensive loans were often destined to default, and ITT knew that. 
In fact, its own analysis projected a default rate of 64% on these loans, key information that was never shared with borrowers. ITT students who wanted to transfer to a more affordable public or not-for-profit school would have found it very challenging to do so as their ITT credits would not transfer. Upon graduation, ITT students faced another sobering reality. ITT promised an education that would land students in a good job and increase their potential earnings. In reality, many students spent their time and money on programs that did not live up to these promises. So although ITT marketed itself as improving consumers' lives, it really was just improving its bottom line. The result was that while many of the students got poorer, the investors and shareholders got richer. Our action today is just the first step that Consumer Bureau is taking to address consumer issues in the for-profit college market. It builds on work that's already underway by a number of state attorneys general and which we are undertaking in close partnership with them. California, Massachusetts, Colorado, New York, and Illinois are also litigating against various for-profit institutions, and I encourage you to take a closer look at their cases. As my colleagues from New Mexico, Illinois, Kentucky, and Iowa will be telling you today, they also have grave concerns about many of the schools operating in this sector. Moving forward, the Consumer Bureau will subject the financial products and services offered by for-profit colleges and their partners to the same standards as any other consumer financial product or service. Consumers need to know what they're paying for, and they need accurate and transparent terms. Unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices will not be tolerated. I would now like to turn it over to, to Attorney General King from New Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Cordray. I'm Gary King. I'm the Attorney General from the state of New Mexico, and, and we're here today um, because we're also specifically bringing a civil enforcement action uh, in New Mexico against ITT Educational uh, for a specific program. And, and Director Cordray talked to you about a lot of the, the problems that we're raising, but this is a problem with the uh, nursing program in New Mexico, and so um, there's a specific problem there in that the nursing program was not an accredited program, and, and the Institute uh, we believe knew that and and made promises in their in their advertising and in their pitch to students that uh, that these students would not be likely to be employable because it was a non-accredited program but they still had the same issues with um, the loan products that that director Cordray spoke about um, and so uh, we we're hopeful in New Mexico to uh, through our action to prevent them from pursuing those kinds of activities and to also um, recoup for our uh, New Mexico citizens and our New Mexico students uh, what we can for uh, under our Unfair Practices Act, uh, both um, uh, recovery for them and, and also fines on behalf of the state of New Mexico. So we're happy to answer questions about that uh, specific case today as well. But we're bringing that case um, actually as we speak, I believe, uh, in the state of New Mexico today. So and, and I think next the program goes to Attorney General Madigan from Illinois. Thank you, General King. The allegations that were made in the lawsuits that have been announced today are familiar to anybody who has taken a serious look at the for-profit college industry. We have certainly seen a similar pattern of problems with for-profit colleges in Illinois. Aggressive and misleading advertising, marketing, and recruitment practices, uh, high tuitions that can cost 10 times as much uh, as a community college and often necessitate students taking out numerous loans that include, in addition to government and private loans, also institutional financing, schools and programs that lack the necessary accreditation for graduates to qualify for career opportunities, transfer credits to other schools, uh, or apply to graduate school, low completion rates, and ultimately an enormous amount of loan debt that is often defaulted on and the servicing of which constrains a person's ability to fully participate in the economy. These are among the reasons that I filed a lawsuit against Westwood College two years ago. Westwood operates several campuses in the Chicago area and more than a dozen others across the country. Students who filed complaints with my office alleged that they were lured by Westwood's promising marketing and heavy-handed recruitment to enroll in Westwood's criminal justice program hoping upon graduation to be qualified to serve as a member of law enforcement. But Westwood's criminal justice graduates did not even qualify to sit for the Illinois State Trooper exam. So many of these once hopeful students are now burdened with debt from the program's $70,000 tuition and a degree that many times has fallen short of qualifying them for jobs that they intended to pursue. What Westwood students have suffered is not an anomaly. 
Thousands of students lured in by the for-profit college industry across the country have found themselves stuck in a cycle of crushing debt. Left unchecked, the abuses of the for-profit school industry promise to produce a new generation of graduates with few employment prospects in their desired field and who will instead endure a future of financial insecurity. It is time that for-profit schools understand that putting profits ahead of student success is an indefensible business practice and that we will hold them accountable for it. Thank you. And let me introduce the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Jack Conway. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate you calling it a commonwealth. That's very astute. <laughs> Lisa's been a great friend uh, on this issue. She and I have testified in front of the United States Congress about some of the for-profit college abuses. And I want to thank Lisa, and I especially want to thank Director Cordray for having us here today. Uh, this is a, a, a real gratifying day for me um, because of what we've done in Kentucky on this issue. And I know I speak for my colleagues that it's wonderful to have a former AG heading up this bureau with, with specific focus on this particular issue. Uh, as I mentioned, I chair a, a group of 32 states that for some time have actually been looking at the for-profit college issue in ways that a st state attorneys general can, ad can address some of the consumer protection abuses. I really began this journey about six years ago when I became AG of Kentucky, and about that time, an institution called Decker College shuttered its doors, declared bankruptcy, and left students holding millions of dollars in loans that the bankruptcy trustee started to try to collect. Uh, our office intervened, got about $4 million in loan forgiveness for those students. Then we had a similar situation with a for-profit uh, unaccredited law school in western Kentucky where we had to intervene and won millions of dollars in loan forgiveness. Uh, I started to take a broader look at the, uh, at the industry in Kentucky. I discovered in, in 2009 that we had about 140 of these programs, 140 for-profit programs in a state of 4.3 million people. We let the data take us to where we needed to be. We looked at the highest, uh, uh, highest student loan default rates. We looked at the advertising practices that, that gave us pause. And we subpoenaed seven of the schools. And Director Cordray mentioned active litigation that's ongoing in the states. In addition to what I'm going to detail a little bit about what we're doing in addition to the, the working group, um, we have active cases involving National College where we have grave concerns about some of their practices in this area. Uh, we have active litigation against Spencerian College, headquartered in, in, in Louisville. Uh, we also have, um, have active litigation against Damar, uh, which is headquartered in, in, in Owensboro, Kentucky. In addition to that, our working group has noted the practices of some of these schools as they pertain to veterans. That's the reason we went after the website GIBill.com, shut it down, got them to pay a fine, um, and actually turned that website over to the Department of, of Veterans Affairs. Basically, what we're finding is that some of these schools are more interested in getting their hands on federal student loan dollars than they are in educating people and placing them in jobs. So in addition to our working group, in addition to what the CFPB is doing, uh, I have joined with Attorney General Miller and a very focused group of 14 states in issuing subpoenas to four particular targets, those targets being ITT, uh, EDMC, Corinthian, and Career Education. Uh, my office is leading uh, the effort in, led the effort in drafting the subpoena for ITT. We've divvied up the work uh, amongst the other colleges, and we will be working tirelessly to make certain that those four schools, but that the industry as a whole, the industry as a whole understands that they need to make accurate representations to students and to understand that they are in the business of educated and not just educating, excuse me, and not just uh, flattering their own bottom line. This is a very important issue to our states, to our consumers, and to each other. Some of these colleges are thriving on selling a dream to someone who's lost a job or is just trying to build a better life for their families. But once the ink is dry on the financial aid paperwork, we too often find that the nightmare begins. And then the school has the money, and the student is on the hook for the rest of his or her life for an education that may not be worth a dime. I'll leave you with one simple question. They're taking over $30 billion in federal money. When, when did taking our tax dollars for the purposes of educating people cease to be a public trust? That's the question I ask. And now I'd like to introduce someone who's been a real partner with us on this most recent effort, Attorney General Tom Miller of Iowa. Tom. 
Thank you, Attorney General Conway, and thank you for your leadership over a period of years on, on these issues. As Attorney General Conway mentioned, uh, he and I partnered up recently uh, and uh, to deal with four um, uh, particular uh, for-profit colleges, and uh, the two of, two of us and, and 11 other states, 13 in, 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 uh, in conclusion, uh, filed um, uh, CIDs against uh, the four colleges earlier this month, including ITT. And so, you know, we're, 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 we're particularly pleased, I would say, that um, the CFPB has filed a lawsuit against ITT, uh, that New Mexico has filed a lawsuit against ITT. Um, we will, of course, work with them and work closely with them as, as we go through our investigation, as the, they go through their litigation. I would just add that we've developed a, a terrific working relationship uh, with the CFPB. Um, the state attorney generals, that is. Um, it's been a partnership uh, from the day one. And, of course, we, we, we had an advantage, didn't we, Rich? With, uh, with your selection, we had a, had a really inside advantage among attorney generals in, in terms of a working relationship. Rich was a terrific attorney general of Ohio that we worked with uh, over, uh, over a period of, of a couple years and did a lot of cases together. So in the public interest, this, this great working relationship uh, has developed between the CFPB and the state attorney generals, uh, where we know each other, we work with each other more and more all the time, we share information, we share strategy, and we think that that's a, that's a very good thing uh, for the public. I would just like to uh, uh, highlight two sort of uh, broad areas that, uh, that we're interested in, in investigating generally uh, concerning uh, the for-profit colleges. And one is the, uh, for some, the boiler room, uh, where people are recruited uh, to these colleges out of a boiler room, uh, where we've seen you know, boiler rooms many, many times over uh, in consumer protection, uh, where there's pressure to make sales, where deception creeps in, where there's more pressure to make sales, where deception increases and increases. Um, that's a terrible way to sign up people for something as important as a college education. The other issue that, that we're, we're centering on, among others, uh, has been mentioned uh, particularly by Attorney General King, and that is that there are courses that would lead to what would naturally expect um, all the coursework necessary to get a license to, to do, a, do some sort of profession um, in, our, in our country. Um, an example is, um, is elementary and secondary education. If you go to college, uh, whether it's online or on ground, and you uh, work towards a four-year degree in elementary or secondary education, you expect, you naturally expect, anticipate that you will get the coursework and everything you need to be certified as long as you can meet the other requirements of state uh, uh, education requirements. Well, uh, of course, in many cases, uh, practice teaching is not available. Uh, people aren't able to get uh, uh, get, a, get a license, as one would naturally expect. Um, Attorney General King talked about the, the nursing area, which, which, is, a, which is another, another area. Um, so those are, those are two sort of broad-based areas that we're investigating. But the, the bottom line is that what the others uh, mentioned, that we're very concerned about these issues. We're de very dedicated to our consumers in America, and particularly our students. And we've built this, uh, this great working relationship with the Consumer Financial Protection Period, uh, Bureau, and we'll utilize that in, in fighting for, for the public interest. All right, uh, with that, we're gonna open this up for some questions, and if you have a question, please raise your hand and someone will bring you a microphone. And please uh, introduce yourself. Thank you. I am Danielle Lee, NBC News Channel. Wondering, as you all mentioned, this isn't a new problem, and we keep seeming to see these practices prop up time and time again. What do you think it's going to take to end these deceptive practices that we're seeing at these for-profit schools? I think it's going to take uh, focus and pressure from the individuals you see in front of you and uh, the other partners that we can bring to bear on this uh, effort. Uh, as, as I think Attorney General Conway said very well, it should be a public trust to be taking public money and educating the future leaders of this country uh, and for people to be distorting that and, and uh, uh, abusing that to their own financial ends is uh, a disgrace and it's something that uh, we have all determined and made a commitment to one another that we're going to be working to clean up. 
And you've recently made uh, new rules regarding mortgages. Is it something in this case where we need to see new rules specific to these for-profit colleges? I don't know whether that uh, at some point might come into play, but uh, we have determined that uh, there's much progress we can make through investigations and enforcement, uh, that people, I think, do understand what the law says about treating uh, students and their families fairly, uh, and we need to make sure that they're actually doing what they should be doing. And so that's the approach we're taking at this point. If I can, just, if I can add a little bit to that, um, <clears throat> I think taking on some of what we perceive to be the worst abuses in the industry has merit in setting an example for other cases. And I think Rich Cordray should be commended because his agency is stepping up. But this is an effort that not only involves just the CFPB, it's going to involve Justice, the FTC, particularly the Department of Education. Uh, I've talked to Secretary Duncan about this issue uh, at length. My office was a representative on the, um, the efforts at negotiated rulemaking that fell apart once again. When um, Lisa Madigan and I were up here announcing what we'd done with GIBill.com, Dick Durbin was at the press conference and had one of the great lines I've, I've, I've heard in politics. He said, he looked right into the microphone and said, you know, if I want to see any of my former colleagues who are now lobbyists, all I have to do is take on the for-profit college industry because they'll all come <laughs> see me. And um, there is a lobbying front that has been put forward by this particular industry that is very formidable. And I think what we're saying today is how do you make change in this industry? We're saying as AGs, and we're saying as this particular agency, that we're going to try to overcome that lobbying front, and we're going to try to have federal-state partnerships that really make some, some substantial changes in this particular business model amongst the worst actors. I just want to add a comment, too, uh, and we've sort of said this already, but um, I'm in my eighth year as an attorney general, and I have found that when the attorneys general of the states work together and, and find a problem that we perceive as one um, that, that goes across the country, that, uh, that, that we're a very formidable group whenever we uh, t take on these uh, uh, bad consumer practices when, when, we, when we want to fight for our consumers in our states, and, and we're particularly pleased now that the CFPB is, is up and running, and indeed we all have had a good working relationship with Director Cordray. I, I think that that uh, federal and state cooperation is going to be really important in taking on some of these questions as well. So, Hi. Thanks. Kate Davidson from Politico. Um, this is a question for Director Cordray. Could you give us a little bit of a sense of how, um, what the enforcement pipeline looks for for similar cases or looks like? I mean, it sounds like you know, you have concerns that this is really an industry-wide problem, obviously. So can you give us a little more detail on that? Well, Kate, uh, I really can't, uh, <laughs> as you know. Nice try. Uh, <laughs> I think what uh, you see in front of you that's important, an important message being sent today is there are numerous pipelines now focused uh, on this problem. Uh, there are numerous actors who have made a commitment to one another, those of us here and others not in this room. Uh, that we uh, understand the importance of this problem to the future of this country, the importance of cleaning up uh, the bad actors in this industry and figuring out uh, how, this, how this industry can be brought uh, into, into alignment with what our expectations, reasonable expectations and, and, and just expectations are for how young people and, and people looking to change direction and improve their lives are treated in this country. So um, there will be more... Uh, uh, matters unfolding publicly in time, clearly, uh, from all of these fronts. Uh, but um, uh, as I said, today is just a first step for the Consumer Bureau, uh, and it builds on and, and joins work that's been done for some time by state attorneys general. If I might be permitted just one follow-up. Um, <laughs> could you give us just a, a little more detail also, or just explain exactly how um, the action today, how you all participated in today's action from CFPB, because it sounds like there's a few different fronts here. There's a working group. So could you just clarify that? So today's action by the CFPB is the filing of a particular lawsuit. As uh, you heard Attorney General King from New Mexico, they also are filing a particular lawsuit. But uh, more we wanted to bring to, uh, to bear on the problem ongoing work that's being done on a variety of fronts, including as uh, Generals Conway, Madigan, and Miller laid out, broad-ranging investigation that's been initiated by a number of states uh, that is in process, including uh, subpoenas. Uh, it's a very, very active effort. 
Uh, we have our own efforts at the CFPB that, uh, as you tried a moment ago, we can't really speak about at this point. Uh, but, um, uh, and I think uh, Attorney General Conway uh, very much was on point in noting that there are other federal agencies who are engaged in work in this area. And uh, part of our goal will be to bring all of these work streams together uh, and work towards some common goals here in terms of making sure consumers uh, get money back that they deserve back, uh, that consumers are treated fairly going forward, uh, and that the industry shapes up. But I think, you know, the, the picture right now for ITT, if you're ITT, you see the, the lawsuit here by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the lawsuit by New Mexico, and 13 states uh, this month have asked for, have served CIDs. So that's, that's immediately. Then you see perhaps other states being involved um, and maybe other federal agencies. So what, what we're trying to do is put together a, a package of enforcement that can support and reinforce each other. And I think you, I'm, I'm describing a picture that lets you start to see that. My name is Joe Tipograph. I'm with the Capital Forum. What advice would each of you have for a, uh, you know, an American who's considering education at a for-profit college as a, an investment in their future? I would say the for-profit college model can work and work pretty well when the school has cr a critical linkage, a critical economic development linkage with jobs that are actually in the community. You know, where our community or technical schools sort of fall short and a for-profit college steps in to train medical technicians or what have you, it, the model has, has worked. I would say to anyone who's thinking, who's thinking about attending a, a for-profit college, um, to look for that particular linkage. Are there actually jobs? They're going to promise you they're going to place you in a job. But are those jobs really there? Uh, read the fine print. Don't be pressured to, um, don't be pressured to uh, sign an agreement on the spot. Uh, if you feel like you're being sold a used car, as was said earlier, that's no way to sign up for a college. Comparison shop. Take a look at, at a similar certificate uh, program that may be offered by a local community or technical college. Uh, check the prices out. Um, in fact, I think I read somewhere recently that about 60 percent of students that go through two-year programs in, um, in, in public associate degree programs come out debt-free. Only 2% of the students in the for-profit realm come out debt-free. Um, and if you're a veteran who's being targeted, understand that that's a real cash cow for these schools because there's something called the 90-10 rule, and most of you here in the room understand it, um, but the DOD and veterans benefits are exempt from that rule. It's a huge loophole. And um, actually, the, the amount of, of, of veterans and, and DOD benefits being steered to the for-profit colleges went up 683% in a recent four-year window. So there are a lot of things to be watchful for. And uh, just don't submit to a high-pressure sales tactic. Understand the loans. Understand the jobs that are out there that they're promising to place you in. Let me add just one more thing. Uh, accreditation. So what we have found with uh, the for-profit schools that we're looking at in some of their programs is they are not accredited uh, in a manner that will qualify graduates. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the Westwood Criminal Justice Program to even sit for the Illinois State Trooper exam. And it's a criminal justice program where people were told that they would be able to uh, be a member of law enforcement in Illinois, and in most circumstances, that is not the case. So you have to ask about accreditation. Uh, if they say they're accredited, you need to find out if that is a national accreditation that mainly runs through some other for-profit entities, or if that is regional accreditation, which is really the gold standard of accreditation in our country for colleges and their programs. And I would just underline what my colleagues said by, by saying this. Don't sign up for a college out of a boiler room. When they call you, you don't expect the call. They pressure you. Uh, they make promises. Don't sign up based on that. Find out about other alternatives. Talk to somebody in your family or some educator that you know to get advice about what the other options are and, and, and what, what, what you should do. But as I, as I mentioned earlier in my, my open re, opening, remar opening remarks, that making these decisions out of a boiler room is a prescription for disaster. Now, you know, there, there are 
there are those students that, that make sense to go to uh, some of the poor profit colleges. And, uh, you know, I think in fairness we need to, to recognize that. And one profile is this, that um, someone has a job um, and a, a decent job, and they can get a pay increase or a promotion by getting a degree, either a bachelor's degree or a, a post-bachelor's degree. And they're able to, to take this online, uh, you know, from their home and continue on in their job and get their, get their uh, promotion or a salary increase or both. For that student, it probably makes a lot of sense to do this. But once you get beyond that, you really have to think carefully about the other alternatives. And the more pressure you, they, they put on you, the more you say no, is what, what students need to say. And they have to get, you know, get a second opinion from a family member you can trust or someone in education that you've known before, before making this decision. Hi, I'm Michael Strafford with uh, Inside Higher Ed. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the negotiated rulemaking process and the gainful employment rules. Um, as you know, they're under review at the OMB right now. Um, I'm wondering if you've had subsequent conversations with folks at either the Education Department or the White House about their current proposal, um, what you'd uh, like to see in that, and how confident you are that um, you'll, you'll get a draft of the rules that you're happy with. I think the Department of Education has made it a point to consult broadly in terms of their rules, but I don't think any of us uh, should comment on their rulemaking process uh, in the absence of an Education Department official uh, in the room. So I, th I think we'll leave that one. Thanks. Hi, Donna Borak with American Banker. Um, it's, you've all mentioned a series of different investigations that are happening uh, within your states or perhaps among different state AGs. Can you give me a sense of the scope of how many are outstanding um, currently nationwide and how many perhaps are overlapping among two or more AG offices? Um, when we formed our working group, gosh, it's been three and a half years ago, um, we had 32 states that signed on board. And, and, and the purpose of forming a, a, a committee like that within the National Association of AGs, known as NAG, one of the more un unfortunate acronyms we have in American politics, the, um, the re is to share information. We have the ability under our various consumer protection acts or, or unfair and false deceptive practices acts to, to share, share information. And we have done that. Um, and their, the CFPB is announcing their action today, but I know California uh, has an active case against Corinthia. New York recently resolved for a 10 or $11 million fine, a case against Career. Um, Lisa Madigan in Illinois has her case against Westwood and also has a very mature case against Corinthian. Uh, I have my three lawsuits in Kentucky against those I've named. Gary in New Mexico is taking his actions today. What happened when, when Tom Miller approached me and, and really joined the leadership effort here was Tom has tremendous experience in, in negotiating through tobacco or mortgage settlements and, and how to work with federal partners and, and really focus these sorts of things. And I think what you're seeing there are, you know, being the chair of 32 states is like herding cats, but what we have is a bipartisan group of 13 now that have said, okay, these four in particular, we've seen enough that we think in addition to these other enforcement actions that they ought to be subpoenaed and they ought to answer some questions. And so um, we will work in concert um, to, to uh, get answers to those subpoenas and take either a collaborative enforcement action or we can take it on a state-by-state -state basis. But that's sort of how it's working out right now. And I don't know if Tom wants to add to that. I think but that covers it, Jack. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me, let me say one thing just to give you a sense. Unlike some of the other, what used to be referred to as multi-state investigations with for-profit entities, um, some of them operate regionally. And so in order to actually look at uh, and find out if the practices that one state may be seeing or the same practices taking place at another school in a different state are seeing, uh, it has been very useful to coordinate. And I think that has been one of the strengths of the working group, that not all these for-profit colleges are operating in every single state. And so it's been necessary to, uh, and I think efficient, uh, for us to come together, and as I stated, uh, we are seeing very common problems and abusive tactics 
in some of the worst of the for-profit schools. And so we're seeing a lack of accreditation. We're seeing very high cost. We're seeing, uh, you know, failure uh, of people to complete the program. We're seeing very um, high levels of debt and very high loan default <coughs> rates. And so when we're starting to see those common practices, uh, we recognize that this is something that we need to uh, really do two things about. You know, one is bring the firepower together to take the enforcement actions, uh, and then two, also to raise awareness uh, to make sure that uh, prospective students recognize uh, the potential dangers for them, uh, not just in terms of trying to get an education, but in terms of the financial instability that they'll face for the rest of their lives uh, if they decide to undertake um, a degree that uh, really doesn't qualify them for the job that they hope to receive. All right, that's all the time we have for today. If you have additional questions, feel free to follow up uh, with me at press at consumerfinance.gov or with any of the individual states. Thanks very much.